you have loads of gods, so many gods, more gods than we can stand. Just listen, la 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 la. <laughs> Ah, I had hoped to find uh, Charles on the altar now as a votive offering, but uh, it's still Elizabeth. Hello, this week we're looking at the crazy world of Romano-British religion. We'll be talking about sacred beliefs and how they changed over time, and the role of hybridisation in securing the loyalty of the natives. And if all that sounds a little bit too much for YouTube, don't worry, we'll be doing it in a suitably frivolous manner. In Roman Britain, there was a unique conflation of local deities with Roman gods, unlike anywhere else in the Roman Empire. A fantastic way to secure the support of the Celtic Britons. I guess it's a little bit like tax cuts just before a general election. Oh, and the world of Roman deities dominates the archaeological record here in Britain, particularly here in the northern military zone. Caesar tells us that the Druids here in Iron Age Britain were behind the organised resistance to Roman rule. And after they were crushed, things moved very swiftly to a Romano-British form of religion, merging Roman gods with Celtic deities. We don't really know why the Britons adopted these uh, new belief systems so quickly and apparently so easily. The Druids had actually been exempt from paying taxes, so they were tax dodgers. Maybe that uh, played a part in it because here in Britain nobody likes a tax dodger, do they? Unless they're doing the tax dodging themselves. The uh, archaeological record here in Britain has yielded uh, loads of votive offerings and also curse tablets warning people off from violating tombs, uh, Lara Croft style. And I just want to be clear that that uh, mention there to Lara Croft was not an example of old man out of touch thinking is trendy. I know that Lara Croft is from the 1990s. In Roman Britain we could make a deity out of anything we wanted to. It was really democratic when you sort of come to think about it. Uh, a door, for instance. There were Romano-British deities for the various components of a door. Until the fourth century, the monotheism of Christianity was largely ignored and Christ was just worshipped alongside a whole array of uh, pagan deities and gods, such as Robigus, the god of mildew on corn. I say, darling, shall we worship Christ this evening for a change? I'm sorry, darling, I know you're rather fond of Christ, but we've got mildew on our corn again. Ah, Robigus it is then. I just think these Romano-British deities, in the context of their time, sound like a lot of fun, eminently practical as well, and uh, clearly a great way for the Romans to exert their control upon the natives of occupied Britain. One YouTube friendly way I thought we could illustrate the sheer diversity of Romano British gods would be to give you a few examples to consider. How about uh, Equitus, the god of fair dealing? Did you see what they did there? Necessitus, the god of destiny. Disciplina, the god of discipline. Or perhaps nowadays we should say the god of the verbal warning. The thing to remember is that the army that came here, certainly in the early phases of the occupation, were from all over the empire. So they brought their gods and religions, be they what we would now call African or Germanic. Never mind that spring that all of the southern YouTubers keep yammering on about. Here in the north it's still winter and I'm recording this outside at the Roman town of Coria, the northernmost 
Roman town in the Empire. The English Heritage Guards in the museum didn't seem very happy about me filming, so that's why I'm doing this out here. But we've come here to look at some great examples of this god hybridization, if you will. First of all, let's have a look at this altar, which is dedicated to Jupiter Delicious. Now, those Roman occupiers didn't just stuff our mouths with gold and consumer goods. They flattered our egos by incorporating our gods into their own religions. This one is a merger of the Celtic goddess Brigantia with the Syrian sky god Jupiter Delicious. And for good measure, they've thrown in his consort, Uno Celestis. And in terms of changing uh, priorities, changing sacred beliefs over time, this altar, unbelievably, was later used as a curbstone. Someone, I guess, must have realised that those cursed tablets were a load of Let's have a look at this wonderful third century relief of Sol. Now, you will probably know, because you're all Roman gazetteers, that Sol was an empire-wide god, endlessly reproduced in statues and co on coins, etc. But have a look at this one. It's got great big fat Celtic lips, big fat wide goggly Celtic eyes, and a great big British hooter. It's an atypical deity. Even back then, 2,000 years ago, the British had to do it their way. Now, beliefs obviously change over time, and here we're talking about a period of nearly 400 years. We're gonna have a look at the interesting case of the Corbridge lion. In the past, experts have wrongly uh, cited this as, a, as an example of significant changes in belief. And their argument runs thus. The, the lion has turned up in various places in Britain on funerary monuments, uh, a sacred uh, symbol to do with death. A worn out one was found just outside this town of Coria on a massive roadside tomb at Shorden Bray. But just half a century later, in the early third century, this magnificent lion was installed as an ornamental fountain in the gardens of a really large house uh, here. And the experts say that that is a sign of uh, something frivolous and that the lion has lost its former sacred value. They believe this was actually designed to go on top of a mausoleum. Um, his teeth were actually removed so that they could ram the spout for the fountain into his, uh, into his gob, so to speak. And uh, experts remind us that uh, violations uh, against a tomb were a criminal offence. So on that basis, they're saying that by the time this lion is removed from a mausoleum and uh, placed in some... Uh, Toff's garden as a, as a feature that uh, something fundamental has changed. But more latterly, um, some other experts have come to accept that the lion may well have been designed for a mausoleum, but probably never made it to the top of one. The idea being that uh, some whoever this wealthy guy was who had this uh, amazing house uh, here at uh, Coria, spotted it in the mason's yard and um, money talks, so to speak. He's a fine beast, isn't he, the Corbridge lion? Uh, but I do feel a bit sorry for his victim. They don't really know what it actually is. Uh, I think it's probably a cow. This town of Corio um, lasted and thrived for over 350 years. That's a long time for uh, beliefs and priorities to change. Another example here at uh, Coria of this idea that uh, sacred beliefs relating to death changed fundamentally is uh, this road here, the Stangate, running through the centre of uh, Coria endlessly resurfaced and in the fourth century they reused tombstones to repair the road but I don't find that uh, particularly surprising again if we don't lose sight of the passage of time how often do we see in a modern day churchyard gravestones that are only 50 years old laying neglected and uh, forgotten 
perhaps we should use uh, redundant gravestones to fix our potholes. After all, we've got enough of them, haven't we? Uh, potholes, I mean. Just as a quick aside, you can see quite well over here how, look at the height of the road there with the uh, endless succession of repairs over 350 years. And uh, they've got evidence here that uh, as a result of that, gradually steps had to be built going down into people's houses and the commercial buildings that operated here. Now, nothing to do with uh, sacred beliefs and uh, crazy gods, but we ought to just touch on the subject of continuity whilst we're here at such a significant Roman town. Now, they think that within 100 years of the end of Roman Britain, the centre of operations of the town had moved over that way to where it continues to this day. And they have interestingly found some carved reliefs here in the ruins of the Roman town, which they now in a very politically correct way uh, describe as medieval uh, items. But uh, us uh, old school antiquarians would call them Dark Ages artefacts. I mean, I think we should just call it the Dark Ages, don't you? Well, that was a little bit of a close uh, escape uh, there. I got accosted on the way out of the museum at uh, Corbridge and asked what it was I was doing, who I was talking to, was I recording, etc. I just looked at them meekly and said, uh, it's just a hobby I've got. And then I did first to speak loses on them and they lost. <laughs> This is actually a really great fort and I'd recommend it as a place to visit. There are no English heritage guards here telling you what to do in terms of filming and the likes. Of course, ultimately beliefs in Roman Britain changed in a big and a fundamental way with Christianity becoming the sole and dominant religion here. There are some historians and indeed amateur YouTube antiquarians who shall remain nameless who believe that the adoption of Christianity in Roman Britain played a significant role in the end of Roman control here. But that's probably a story for another day. I think these are the remains of the bathhouse uh, here and you used to be able to uh, see them better but uh, I think it's those folks at English Heritage have decided that they need to be turfed over for their protection. They know best don't they? That's the fort's strong room there which uh, enables me to seg seamlessly into something I wanted to have a quick chat with you about in terms of YouTube matters. It is absolutely freezing here today. I really appreciate the growth that we've had on the channel in recent months and all the lovely comments, mainly lovely comments that we've been getting uh, down below, but I'm still not monetized. And making these videos does actually cost quite a bit of money. There's the petrol, other travel related costs, all the equipment, etc. I've been thinking about these buy me a coffee ideas. But uh, it might just be me showing my age. The idea of buying me a coffee, which is just a euphemism, isn't it, for giving me money, feels a little bit like uh, begging or pleading. So let me know in the comments uh, down below what you think about that idea. Do you buy other YouTubers a coffee? Would you buy me one? Would you buy me a coffee? As a Romano Briton, you could pretty much make up a god for whatever you like. You could make it up for your mobile phone, obviously they didn't have those, or you could make it up for your script for your YouTube uh, video. I hope you've enjoyed this one. Please like and subscribe, all that sort of stuff. I'm gonna go over to the altar now um, and make a little prayer to my own god. Ah! I pray to Subscriptia, goddess of YouTube. Please get me more likes and subscribes. Oh, and make sure they click on the notifications so they never miss out on another upload. <laughs>